For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you, by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Verse 11. As an apostle, Paul had the spiritual gifts. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. He is a Jewish apostle. Therefore, his apostolic gifts follow those who believe under his ministry. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. The purpose of imparting a spiritual gift is to establish the believer mentally and spiritually. It has nothing to do with salvation or going to heaven. The spiritual gift gives the Christian stability in the faith. Most Christians who talk about spiritual gifts are not established in the faith, and they are not mentally or spiritually stable in their faith. Charismatics are nearly always worried about losing their salvation or committing the unpardonable sin. There is no way to be rooted and grounded, either mentally or spiritually. Then you worry about your salvation all of the time. The Apostle Paul said, Herein, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have whole boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 to 18. The Christian who is rooted and grounded in the faith never worries about his salvation or going to hell. The established Christian knows that as, that as the Lord is up in heaven, so is he, as far as his standing is concerned. A Christian is seated with Christ in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. That won't change. The Christian has been born again as a son of God. That won't change. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. When the Lord looks at the Christian down here, he sees him just like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that is his standing in Christ. His state might be something different. He might be in somewhere, wherever in Finland or England or Australia or Florida or Minnesota or New York, Beijing and so on. But as far as the Christian standing is concerned, he is in Christ and Christ is in him. Now a Christian can be de-established de in faith when he is not rooted or grounded in the scripture. All that has to happen is for some heretic to, some, to come alongside him and give him a gaff, a hook, and then he is all messed up. That usually happens with charismatics. They, they will hardly ever witness to a lost fellow. But when you lead someone to the Lord, all of a sudden, there they are, to talk to your convert in the one big mess. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 to 14. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The Christian is to grow up in his faith. He is to be anchored in what he believes, so that he won't be moved by false doctrine. The slate of men, verse 14, is like the slate of hand practiced by magicians. The hand is quicker than the eye. The purpose of a magician is to make you, make you see something that is not there, or take your eyes off something that is there. Now the holiness people use verse 11 to prove what they call the second work of grace. The idea espoused by the holiness crowd in verse 11 is that the Roman, Romans were waiting for Paul to come along and give them something they didn't have before. 
They tie verse 11 to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 to 15, where Paul speaks of a second benefit, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6, where he speaks of Titus finishing in the Corinthians the same grace also. So they call this doctrine the second work of grace, so called. The first work of grace is, of course, salvation. The second work of grace is supposed to be complete sanctification or the eradication of the old nature. Any gift listed in the New Testament, specifically 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that is not a sign to Israel is still in effect. You can have a spiritual gift imparted to you, but if a certain gift like tongues is a sign to Israel, then it goes out with the apostles, because the apostles have the apostolic signs. After salvation, many Christians have a great emotional experience with the Lord than they did when they got saved. That makes a lot of them doubt their salvation. The problem comes when you have a crisis in your life. At that point you have a direct confrontation with the Lord. When you surrender your will after a fight with God over, the situ over that situation, it's much more emotional than salvation. But feelings and emotions aren't salvation. I may not know the precise time you time you were saved, but I do know when you were saved. You were saved the moment you quit trusting your own righteousness to get you to heaven and started trusting the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Whenever that happened, that's when you were saved. When I believed and when I start trusting the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I didn't feel much, nothing, anything special, anything emotional. And in that time, when I believed Lord Jesus Christ, and Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, I knew I was saved in Jesus Christ because of faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 11, Paul was going to see the Romans in order to help them out. But in verse 12, he told them that they were going to help each other. Paul is very human. If you read 2 Corinthians, you will see just how human he is. His letter, letters are personal, down to earth. It's not just doctrine. Now I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul says in verse 13 that he was led hitherto, there is a case where the word let obviously means prevented. He was going to come to Rome, but something stopped him. Incidentally, the word let has three meanings in the Bible. The Greek scholars only found two. To stop and to allow, they actually missed one meaning. In Mark chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus said, A certain man planted a vineyard and led it out to husbandmen. In that verse, the word let means to rent or to lease. There is no problem in understanding that word. Just look at, the, look at its context. Paul's purpose in coming to Rome was that he might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Notice that he said fruit among, among you. The you here includes all Romans, both the saints and the unsaved Gentiles. He wanted to come to Rome and see some of the people there saved under his ministry. So the book of Romans is written first to all that be in Rome, both saved and lost, and then to the beloved of God called to be saints. Verse 7, the saved, saved specifically. So while some of Romans is aimed right at the saved, there is a lot in the book for unsaved Gentiles, as we will see. The word fruit in the New Testament is incorporates many things. In the parable of the sower and in the parable of the wet and the tears in Matthew chapter 13, the fruit is obviously souls being saved. In Romans chapter 6 verse 22, the fruit is the personal righteousness and holiness of a Christian. 
In Romans chapter 15, verse 28, the fruit is giving in the context, giving to poor saints. Romans chapter 15, verse 26. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, is the fruit of the Spirit, various character traits which we should allow the Holy Spirit to bring, bring forth in our leaves. Finally, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, you have the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. All of these are fruits that Christians should bear in their leaves. The pattern which Jesus set down in John chapter 15 is fruit, John chapter 15, verse 2. More fruit, John chapter 15, verse 2. And much fruit, John chapter 15, verse 5. Every Christian should strive to bear as much fruit as he possible can. He is to allow the Lord to remove those things which will hinder his fruit bearing. That is what Paul sought to do. He wanted to win unsaved Romans to Jesus Christ, but he also, as we have seen in the previous paragraph, sought to see fruit produced in the leaves of the saints in Rome as well.